Hello and welcome to Decoding Resilience. I'm Andrew Fullen and with me is Ed Joe Botsis and we're from Sajeti Labs. We're going to be talking to you about a topic that's probably very important for us and for everyone in 2020. Just a little bit of a sort of a hygiene introduction before we get started. This is being recorded and there will also be an opportunity at the end for you to ask any questions, which hopefully Edso will be able to and we'll take it from there. So this is part of a regular series of with asking Edso just to over to you. Who are you? Where am I? Uh, That's a philosophical question, but uh, for this context, uh, um, I'm at Robertius at 14 years at Society, uh, currently enterprise engineer and enterprise architect. Um, and I'm also part of the architecture leadership. So I'm focusing with other colleagues on the DIA view on enterprise architecture. And recently I finished my master thesis at the Antwerp Management School on the topic of resilience and anti-fragility. Which is very timely because 2020 has really not been a year like any other year that I think any of us have experienced or ever expected to experience. And resilience is certainly one of the words that's been used in my part of the world a lot. And we're going to be using some different technology during the webinar today. And one of them is going to be the chance for you to sort of interact with us um, with word clouds and with answers to the survey. We're going to start with a very, very simple question. And it's basically, where are you from? So if you can go into your browser and type in menti.com, and when it comes up, it's going to ask you for a code. If you could put in 2239279, you'll then be able to type in where you're from. And we'll get to see a bit of a word cloud develop. And I'm going to do exactly the same as well. Already have one answer. Uh, that's someone being very, very quick. Like me, who sort of hunts for the keys. So I've, I've managed to put mine in there now and can see that we've got a few sort of coming in. So Netherlands, India, Sweden. So this is this is what we're going to use um, as a way of being able to interact with us, get your opinion on a few things. As so, we'll give it a few moments. Just as we see, we've got someone from Iceland, from the U.S., Kansas City. Oh, I hope hope you're not getting any of the storms over in San Francisco now. Oh, that's Daniel. D Daniel, you, you're not in San Francisco. Belgium is not San Francisco. Got Luxembourg. So yeah, um, nice sort of wave of different sort of representations from points to jetty around the world. Nice to see Toulouse join us as well. And I think that's probably going to be enough of that to get started. So it's working. We, we know where we're going to go for that. So Edzo, we, we've sort of um, heard a lot about resilience, about the new normal, about organizations bouncing back after all of the challenges of 2020. For you, what what do you think sort of sums up at a very high level resilience? I think we've lost audio. Okay, that's interesting. I will go to back. the. F oh, I'm back. That that's really interesting. Hold on. We, we're tempting fate talking about resilience have... on the internet these days. I think. 
Yeah, and uh, multiple devices. So my audio is going from this nice uh, microphone to a really expensive device to USB with cables to my laptop. To this stuff, and this is also where my uh, this is also where my thesis is about. So if Thijs can go to the slide of uh, oh no, that's too fast. So resilience means about absorption changing. Uh, and um, there are different types of resilience that I want to present to you that both have a different behavior. So it's a really complex word and I want to um, split up in different um, categories for you so we can discuss how to design systems that are resilient or design organizations that are resilient. So before we go into the detail of that, Edzo, I think it would be good if we could do our second poll, which is trying to get everyone mm -hmm. in the audience to sort of pick a word of what resilience actually means because there's many different meanings as there are people who are actually um, voting on all of this. So if you can all go in there now, please, and enter, you know, one, two, three words, what it means to you. The interesting part of this is while well, people are entering their um, um, what they feel what resilience is, I have found in my research multiple um, uh, literature researches that stated that uh, there is no clear definition of this word. And that means that um, everything we're going to see here is true in itself. Uh, there is no wrong answer on this, and that makes the word really powerful and interesting because now we as a group in social labs can align on what our definition is within the context of organizations or systems. I think it's a, I think it's a good word for us to use because we can define it. We can set the agenda for people. And yeah. as long as we all agree what it means, uh, hopefully by the end of the day, we'll have a sort of a common set of understandings from there. But we can see that there's, you know, boun bouncing back, strength, flexibility, yeah robust, um, yeah. bounce back there in a slightly different spelling. So you, you, can, you can see that there's a lot of words coming through there, a lot of different meanings to people. But I think a lot of the things that have been talked about are what I would have expected people to say is resilience before sort of having a chance to talk to you and learn more about your thesis mm -hmm. and some of the different definitions that the academic world has for it because I think it might be fair to say that the academic world has some different opinions amongst itself. Yeah, a lot. So uh, just like I said, the, the, the uh, resilience has been seen by different research in different contexts with different definitions uh, and there was no overall definition and it made it really difficult to make it actionable. So if we talk about resilience in a biological system, um, it appears to have different words from the word clouds than if we talk about something like hardware. Um, and I started on my uh, thesis looking at back at a book from Nicola Taleb about anti-fragility in 2012. And he's talking about uh, the, the optima form of a resilient organization. And I want to, to make that actionable at my client. I could not find out how, how this should be done. Um, and that is why I uh, started my uh, research to find out what can I find about the definition of resilience and then into fragility um, um, to make it actionable, to get us uh, uh, into what to do at our clients, what to do if you're in a software project, what to do if you're a business change project. Um, did did you change your mind as to what resilience meant during all of your research? Did you, know, did you start yeah. with this is resilience and in fact, that's where you ended up by the end of it. I, I ended up, um, I started with just like a word cloud, a, a few associative words and a foggy image, but I always thought about it being one thing. And, um, um, and basically resilience can be depicted in three things. So I, 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 I sharpened my own definition on resilience and I placed those in, in a certain context so that makes it really clear how um, to have conversations with, for example, an executive leadership about what resilience is. Um, and perhaps we can go to the slide with the nice um, bell curve, um, because I think most people recognize that one. But if you look from a helicopter view at resilience, um, 
um, basically what we see is that something happens and it decreases the value uh, uh, of a system and then the system needs to absorb it. So, um, um, for example, if you hit with the football uh, against uh, a window, you see that the ball is absorbed by the window and after that the ball is bouncing back and then it's, the window is recovering. Uh, and it's the same with the table or with some, uh, some putty. Um, and resilience is basically the period between the, the start absorption and the point it's going back to the old normal. Um, and I think we all see resilience as something like this, but where the worst cloud is generated is the, um, the subtypes of resilience. How do you achieve resilience? I think there is a really interesting domain to have discussions on what is resilience. So with the diagram that you've got there, the bell curve, you could almost overlay the timeline of 2020 with January at the left and hopefully not far from where we are now towards the right. And we can see where we're absorbing all of the shocks of the year. We're being resilient, we're, we're absorbing it, we're dealing with it, and then we're going into that recovery phase and then hopefully going back to the old normal, but perhaps a better normal as well. Yeah, so that's what I found. And if you go to our next slide, uh, we see that dissection. Um, because basically there are three behaviors we can see. Um, the first behavior um, is called engineering resilience. And this is a definition I uh, found that was provided by Martin Brenk. So this is not my own def definition. And he stated um, engineering resilience is um, the behavior of a well-designed system. For example, a, a large wooden table. If I going to sit on that table, um, it slowly changes, it slowly bends a little bit and then it goes back. It's a little bit bouncy, just like a phone that you drop. Um, and a well-engineered system goes slowly back to the old normal. Now, at the current world, we see we're not going back to the normal like a V uh, curve. Now something different is happening. And the second type of resilience is where there are backup systems in place. Just, uh, for example, your laptop. Um, your battery in your laptop is a backup system for your power socket. So if the power socket goes away, something changes in your laptop. Um, the behavior changes and slowly the battery takes over yeah, within a few nanoseconds, but still slowly. And you can work on your laptop. And it's the same with a government. If the the central government fails because there are elections or they are on holiday. Um, the decentralized government, your uh, municipal, that will take over the uh, certain functions. And there we see other words that we saw in the word cloud. This is a more uh, slowly but um, uh, um, recovery because the other system takes over the function. So um, the, 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 the laptop still works, the function of the laptop is still the same, but something else is delivering the power. Um, and the third one, and that's where we're looking at, at the current uh, world, but uh, also with companies that are being disrupted, is that there is a, a stressor, something that happens, but needs to be corrected, but the organization is able to reconfigure itself, to go on new alliances, to create new stuff, to sell other stuff. And then um, uh, there's a possibility to create more value. So we're doing something different, doing not same. And I think uh, during COVID, it takes such a long time and it um, is so impactful in how we are interacting with each other um, that we are reconfiguring ourselves. So this webcast is an example of it. I mean, uh, this was not there before for us. Uh, and we're trying to add new value. It looks really pretty and we can improve from audio quality and we can improve from latency. Uh, and we're a learning organization. So if we keep up with this in like a few months, it's going to be a top notch uh, uh, production. Uh, even now it's much better than we did in December last year. And um, those are really different behavior types. And it's important to look at your um, software, your DevOps team, organization or your country to decide which behavior do I want to um, uh, display and because it all is costing something nothing is for free so you have to be really aware which behavior do I want to have in my system and then you can design the system to show that behavior 
is there actually a fourth type of resilience, which is really all of these being added together for an organization, for a country, for people, where it's part of one, part of two, and part of three, all added together to give you something that can have that engineering resilience, can be a resilient system, but can also adapt, and that it's not just a case of picking one. Yeah, so that's something I discussed in my thesis, and I think it's also something really nice for, um, at the end, we have an open mic uh, discussion about it, because it's pretty um, a diverse in topic. Um, but in the end, an organization is a system of systems with a lot of sub-systems. Um, and it's important to have a robust part, so something that's there and um, uh, provides our um, monthly pay or provides our power. Um, but it also has to be something that uh, is fragile, that breaks, like uh, um, a circuit breaker at your power uh, electricity uh, uh, circuit. Um, you have to know somewhere what's going wrong, and you only know something's going wrong if something breaks. So you need a fragile part in your organization. So you, you always need a combination of, uh, um, of stuff. So if all the systems are a complex adaptive system, um, um, it will not go any further because even a complex adaptive system needs uncertainties. Um, and that is are provided by robust systems. So yes, and, and that's the interesting part of this. So your finance department should show a different behavior than um, the, your R&D department, for example, and your cafeteria should show a different behavior than your sales to get it on organizational level. So last time we were t we were talking about this in sort of preparation, you actually gave me you could you could talk about about resilience about a small local organization to you that, that had actually been able to adapt, to be able to change to the, the world. Could you tell the listeners a little bit about that, please? Ooh, yeah, <clears throat> I'm um, um, closely following two um, 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 restaurants here in Hilversum, and they're both um, uh, owned by a family. So uh, one is a family, one is a an, um, self-employed person. Um, and what they did when COVID started, they sh needed to shut down their restaurants, just like 1800 shut down your restaurant, no preparation, so they did. And what they did is open the Gmail account and taking digital orders, never, and they never done that before. And they started distributing their food uh, via a bike, and they never done it before. So from an organizational design level, they changed their um, sales channels, and they changed their distribution channels. And they even changed their products. So the the, the restaurant uh, usually took people in and at tables, and now they made um, um, recipes that could are ready to be warmed in your normal oven and have really high quality because it was a really quality high quality restaurant. So that means that even their products and their services are changed. And now that the COVID um, measurement of um, regulation has changed, so they now are allowed to receive guests, they still have that um, um, revenue channel. So now they're making more revenue than before. And the digital uh, revenue they created, so by giving getting orders by email and distributing it by bike and a car, was even more revenue than purely the guests they had. So even during the COVID uh, crisis, they made more revenue than before. And this is a really nice example of the, the, the third type of resilience, uh, making the best out of a crisis. So the famous saying is never waste a good crisis. It never waste a good crisis means also innovate and change. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because this is the, the chance you have to try new uh, distribution channels, new products and services. Uh, but it also means that you have to have the freedom to do that. So for a government that is... Um, uh, providing uh, certifications for something has a less ability to do that. So uh, it's not applicable for every organization. But if you are an SME, uh, this is really easy to implement. Uh, but it needs some guts and some money. So why why do you think the restaurant was able to do that when so many didn't? Did they get lucky, or you know were they able to approach it and think their way through the problem as to how to adapt? It's difficult to say because I did not do any research to this. 
so I did not find, I did not talk to the people that failed in it. Uh, but what I do know of the people that did, they are really creative and already have um, learned from the previous crises. So the restaurant this was family owned. Um, at the crisis of 2008, um, they had to let go of their company and the family scattered around uh, at different companies to uh, make an earning. And a few years ago, they rebuilt this company in a structure to be adaptive. So they have a central organization that does, does the rent and the, the, the uh, goes to the suppliers. So I think it's about lear uh, what I found in the literature. Learning is really important. Having some money on the bank is really important to make uh, the best case of what you're doing. Uh, and in the end, creativity is the thing that uh, makes or breaks this. So if you're not an entrepreneur and don't have the freedom and the creativity to act, um, th then you will break as uh, uh, you cannot innovate. Uh. Now that, that that makes sense. So it's it's they they learn from the hard lessons. In in effect, it's the sort of thing that yeah. we as Sujeti want to be able to do is take out the best of lessons learned on a global scale and share those with our customers and potential customers and help them adapt and improve, not just when they need to be resilient, but at other times as well. Yeah. So how do you think the academics would view the rest of that? Would, would they say, yep, good job, or would they point out they should have done things different? Or would they, they, they not sort of go to those sort of restaurants? Um, I don't know if academics have an opinion on that, <laughs> and I'm not not there to to answer that. Okay. Um, what I do know, and that's the, um, the part we're going to approach uh, uh, in a few seconds, is um, this is a topic that's really new. So it's about complexity science. Yeah? So we talked about the organization is a part of a lot of systems. That topic's really new. The topic of resilience is really new. Uh, the book of Talap at 2012, um, introducing anti-fragility, making real a point why it's important to be resilient. Um, there are a lot of papers written about it, but it's not backed up by a lot of research. So oh, what I know about this topic is that what I'm going to present in a few seconds is what I found in the literature that's available and what um, um, smart people are contributing to what is needed to be resilient. Uh, but in the end, the, the academics are not there yet. So the good part for us is that um, nobody knows. So if we as a society are um, preparing our clients on, on with small steps and learning from those small steps, but within a an, an framework, um, um, we at least know that we're heading the right direction. Uh, and as long as we are keep inno innovating, uh, we can inspire the academics on what works, what doesn't work. Because that's really difficult. Uh, we know that there are, if you are an entrepreneur, you have a lot of money and you have a lot of passion, it's still a guarantee that something will work. So it's 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 more than that, and that makes it really interesting to study this topic because there is no single word that will fix this uh, this challenge. You have to really um, design the organization, design the system with the purpose in mind to be resilient, and then even that's no guarantee. So it sounds like there's opportunities for us both to look at this as a topic. Do, do some innovation around it, but also to reach out to our customers, potential customers, and offer them the advice and guide them through how they can be more resilient. And one of the things that we'll yeah. come back to will be um, a sort of a bit of a call to arms to some of the Sujeti Labs members as to how they may be able to help with this. And we'll, there's probably time for your next slide, Edzo. Yeah, and uh, we had a question uh, before that slide. Um, oh, we've got loads of questions. I was, I was, oh, ho ho no, no. <laughs> we, um, really sort of got towards the end so that we could do them. But if you want to tackle some now, I've got a screen full over here of um, questions. 
um, uh, um, I'm, I'm okay to take a question and then we can go to the um, Mentimeter question about the enemy of resilience and then we can go in depth into the uh, attributes of the resilient types. Well, what, what, one of the questions that came in from Mikael, thank you Mikael, is what's the difference between resilience and anti-fragility? Uh, that's a good question. Um, um, resilience um, is about the value and time. So the graph we, uh, we showed is a function uh, about the value of the system and in time if you bounce back to the original value or succeed it. Anti-fragility is the behavior about um, uh, stress and value. So the dimension time is not there. So basically, and fragility um, is a word that you can use um, in the context of fragile and robust. Those are also in the same dimension. And you describe the behavior as something happens to your system. So what happens if you hit uh, the table with a hammer? A fragile um, uh, table will collapse. Um, a robust table doesn't give any movement and as a fragile table will increase in value, become more shinier. Um, I've and, got to have one uh, of those immune... yeah. If you have an, an, a metal table and you want to have some, some interesting arty look, the, the, the blacksmith will hit it with hammers and will uh, mm. change, uh, add value with every stroke. <laughs> um, and even if you are making a sword uh, or something else, a blacksmith adds value to steel by hammering it. But uh, a better example is our immune system. Uh, our immune system is um, uh, trained by diseases, by bacteria, by viruses, and it, and it becomes stronger and it can attack also bacteria and viruses that are similar, not precisely the same that made you sick. So mm -hmm. anti-fragility is basically the optimization of resilient behavior. I, I like that. So it, it it actually leads on to one of the other questions, which I was saving towards the end. But you, you you've mentioned <laughs> about the immune system and really brought nature into the equation. What what can we learn from nature about making organisations making and making ourselves and those around us and those important to us um, more resilient? That's a really interesting question, and for people that have written the book of Taleb, uh, recognize uh, the the role of nature. And what we see is that stuff that we as people build usually are um, losing value if you do not touch it and over time. Uh, it is going to rust, it's going to decay. And from nature, we know if we leave it alone, it stays intact or it grows in value. Yeah, I know some people create a nice ecosphere in a nice bottle and have it there for 10 years and it's still alive. That Something like that can only be done with nature at the moment. Exactly. If we do that with something else, like a, a building, uh, we see that it becomes a ruin. And that's really interesting. Um, what Taleb did was try to look at nature and see what is needed to be anti-fragile. Um, uh, and that's also what I did in the, the framework I'm presenting. Uh, I made a distinction, what are the dynamics in an in a nature ecosystem that uh, improves the value because everything is stimulating each other. And what's the difference to a system that is man-made that does not learn from random stuff? See, what, one of the things that I always think in nature is very, very resilient is the pigeon. It's a bird that people think mm. is stupid, but it survived with humans, it thrived with humans. It walks across the road and it never gets hit by the cars, in my experience. And there's always more pigeons. Everything attacks pigeons, and yet there are still always more pigeons. And they can eat anything, and they just keep on making more pigeons. And they seem to be a very resilient creature by doing a few things very, very simply. They eat anything, they can live almost anywhere, and they're not threatening to people. A beautiful part of this is that we look at the pigeon as a, as a uh, abstract something. Yeah? We don't call it the pigeon peat. The pigeon peat is not anti-fragile. Now the species pigeon is anti-fragile. And that's a mindset you also have to have for your company. Um, it's okay if business unit goes bankrupt. It's okay if a team does not deliver or needs to be dissolved. 
but you need to make certain it learns from that and it can evolve. So uh, for the nature it's there, we call it evolution. We state now not only the pigeon itself, so pigeon peat should adapt to the system at, uh, at the moment. It should learn, it should be, uh, but it also should, uh, if pigeon peat dies, the, 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 the species pigeon should become stronger because uh, um, the pigeons that can see infrared are more likely to survive. Or uh, they learn from each other now, ah, Pigeon Pete uh, did cross the road when the light was on uh, red. So we should learn as a species not to do that anymore. And that's really important. So that, That's true, because I used to get the underground train into London until this year. And last year, there was one Pigeon used to get the train. By the time lockdown came around, it had five friends that had joined it to take the train into central London. And it would get on at exactly. the same spot every single day and adapt. So adaption is not only about DNA, but also about uh, learning from behavior from others and then improving your own behavior. Mm -hmm. So th th thank you for the blog suggestion, by the way, Daniel, on pigeons and resilience. We'll have a look at that one <laughs> later. Good find. So let's let's move on to the next slide, please. We're, by the way, we're trialing a voice assistant. It's called Thies. Thank you very much for all of your efforts on this, Thies. So if you could move to the next slide. So what do people think are the enemies of resilience? So again, if you go to Menti, you can enter the code 22392279. And let's see what you think are the enemies of resilience. focus on previous normal I can't even say that one <laughs> complacency I think that's yeah I'm um, lack of information that's an interesting one not quite sure what that means um it, maybe lack so of it information was lack of, yeah. an interesting part about lack of information um, um I'm I'm spewing a lot of information but um, the definition of chaos is that um, not all information is there and even if you have the information you cannot predict the future and an entire fertile system and I think also an, a cost resilient system are the only systems that can um, survive a chaotic uh, situation and and that's interesting part. So a part of my thesis was about what is knowledge, what is reality. Um, um, we as enterprise architects, enterprise engineers, try to be really smart. We try to collect all the information. Uh, I think software architects are the same uh, in this. We try to collect all the information, all the patterns, and design the perfect system. Um, but that's based on our observation, and we have to um, concede in that because we know. There are a lot of unknown unknowns. And, uh, COVID, we know there are viruses out there. We knew the COVID strain, uh, uh, but how it impacted our life at this moment, uh, not everybody had predicted that. Just a few, but not everybody. And um, and that's going to happen a lot. And we saw it the past few years a lot. Nobody knew that the financial crisis would be this big. So in the, the challenge is to design organizations that can uh, deal with the unknown unknowns and therefore can deal with the lack of information. I, so that's, I, I, uh, I think yeah, you're right challenge. there. I, th I think you're very right. You can probably also over-engineer what you're trying to build um, yeah. to deal with all of the problems. I've done it myself years ago when I worked in a software house. We put out a system and our customers found no bugs. We could have gone out two months earlier because we had the support infrastructure in place to deal with any issues and had two months of the marketplace to ourselves. And we went for something that had been assessed. And in fact, we'd lost something of the flexibility about getting out there and learning from what happens in the real world. And it's complacency yeah, so still... for that. Yeah, we see a, a, a parallel of the whole driver be, behind agility in all the discussions um, our agile coaches have with our clients for the past 10 years. 
uh, about letting go. Embrace mm. the chaos, embrace the change, let go of being perfect. Um, the, 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 just ship it, um, um, what we had on our walls in uh, 2010, 2012. Uh, that's the discussion about this, about accepting that you don't know, accepting that you need to learn, accepting that the step forward is better than think and stand still. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not for every context the same, but it's also a different topic <laughs> for later. Uh, but th that's important to know, eh? to know that in your context, it's more important to adapt and to change than to be perfect. I, I, I think you're completely right. I mean, the, these, these really are the enemies of resilience that we're seeing here. Yeah. I mean, fear, complacency, that fear of change, not having done it before. Mm -hmm. It's the ancient Greeks, when they built the temples, things like the Parthenon, they had a concept, I think it's Moria, which is flex, where they would put it into the pillars and the buildings that they put together, which means that they, they could wobble a little bit. They weren't the most stable, yeah. rigid structure, but they could absorb the earthquakes. They could respond and they would bounce back. <laughs> Some, sometimes we try and make sure that we can stop every problem, the problems, because we'll never get them all. No, and, and and I think, yeah, if we use the inverse of these words, we know what we need to do. Mm. We have to net, have to reduce the fears, or we have to increase the confidence and the safety of people. And we have to embrace the change, or the static state uh, is is um, is not there anymore. Uh, and it's only possible when you have uh, are empowered to change it yourself. Yeah, because otherwise you're just another uh, back in the big uh, system. Uh, no, that so, makes sense. That definitely and, makes sense. Are there any simple rules that we could sort of take away to help us keep resilience really in our sort of focus that we can start looking at all of the things around us? Yeah, and um, for me, the, the next slide is, is for me the, um, the talking point for that, um, because it entails a lot of information. And I well, want to... Big words you there, so you're going to have to explain yeah. to me. Uh, yeah, we're going to take a lot of time for this, <laughs> because it's a layered cake. Uh, architects like layers. Uh, it, it's all about layers. Yeah. Um, if you look at the two, blick, uh, two big blue columns, we see attenuate variety. Um, and attenuate is another word for dampening, and variety is another word for different states. So attenuate variety means we want to reduce the, the difference uh, of states. We want to standardize everything. We want to put everything in the same process. So how this is a coping mechanism we have learned in the past 20, 30 years. Uh, look at a problem, decompose the problem, define a process. Um, if the process is unknown, we can make a form in an IT system. People can fill it out in the form and then that way the information is transported through the process. And later on, we created all kinds of processes up on, uh, on top of processes to double check uh, stuff and for checks and balances. So the left side is the, the, the attenuate variety, something we're really good at. Uh, as at IT people, as business managers, uh, business schools, uh, MBAs, all, all that work. The right side we have gone called amplified variety, and that's about um, embracing the chaos, empowering people, um, making certain that you have a lot of different ways to deal with reality, a lot of tools, a lot of different people. Um, so the way to cope with the uh, reality that's really complex. You state, ah, I have to uh, also become uh, embracing more varieties. I have to have more uh, different types of programming uh, styles inside of my ecosystem. So those are to two total different ways of dealing with reality. The left side is controlling and the right side is um, um, empowering. It's what I like did right is side, the, yeah? like agile. In some yeah. respects, you know, having that diversity, the self-organization, yeah. the fail fast. But I've, I've got to yeah. ask, what's Seneca's barbell? Oh, that's, that's what you, uh, um, um, 
Okay, let's skip for that and then we go back to the engineering types. So the Seneca's barbell is introduced by Taleb and it states, um, um, if you invest in something, you have to divide your portfolio in two parts. Um, the biggest part, so 80 to 90% of your investment should be in a predictable, robust system. Something that you know that will provide revenue, will provide income, and that's um, uh, impervious for most of the changes in the world. Yeah, so the, the, uh, diversify in the predictable stuff. But we also know if you put your money in places that are safe, you will not get a, a huge revenue that uh, 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 get not a lot of money back. Um, so if you want to make money and you want to um, evolve, you have to take risks. He said, and, and, and Seneca's barbell is that you should use 20 to 10% of your uh, budget for those steps. So high risk and high revenue uh, um, uh, actions. And that can be a different product pipeline. It can be investment in a different investment fund. It can be uh, a spike during your agile uh, sprints. Um, you're not certain if it will return some revenue, but if it is successful, it will leverage um, your whole company. And this can be the case for IT systems, this can be the case for uh, uh, development teams, and this can also be the case for a large organization like uh, Capgemini. Uh, we are really big and it's important that all the people have their um, uh, income uh, because there's a lot of families. So also the management of Capgemini looks at this from a Seneca's barbell. It states, okay, 80% of my investments are on the safe side, nothing fancy, predictable, uh, and some innovations to be uh, to, to keep on learning, to keep exploiting the, the opportunities you see. Uh, so Seneca's Barbell is about that behavior and having that in place. It's giving and, a thousand pounds um, or thousand yeah. dollars to Mark Zuckerberg when he was just starting um, because he had it spare as opposed to putting a thousand dollars to IBM. Yeah. Yeah, and, and everybody states if you invest in something with a high risk, only do it with money you can lose. And that's yep. also Seneca's barbell. Uh, make certain that if you lose the money, you don't go belly as a company, as a person, as a team. It's, and that is one of like the attributes. Yeah. Where, where they yeah. go out and they, yeah. they, they spread their money across a number of organizations, knowing that one or two yeah. of those will pay off big time and the other ones that lose. On, on so important to them and it, the same with our sort of technological approach then is, is how I'm reading this now. Yeah, yeah. and that's true and, and for example if you're in a team and you know you have every sprint 50 story points uh, you can state we, for, of those 50 we did by default use 10 or 5 for innovation stuff mm -hmm. to, to, to do some research at something that will um, increase our velocity by a lot and the first three, uh, four times, um, ah, there it goes. And the first few times it doesn't add any revenue, but uh, at the fifth uh, sprint, it adds a lot of value. And the next time you're not bottled against 50 story points, but you can increase to 70 story points because of that investment. And then on the long term, it pays out. So yeah. it's applicable to everything, not only money investment, but it's applicable to everything. And that's for all the words you see here. So what I did, I did research on over 300 resources and I selected about 90. And from those 90 resources, I selected 16 to provide some um, attributes. <clears throat> and I put them in um, and I categorized them in the three resilient types we discussed before. Um, I put enter fragility uh, at the right because people were mixing the words up. So the question Michiel asked about uh, um, what's the difference between the resilience and the fragility. Um, I saw that a lot of papers did not um, look into that. They made it a synonym. So that's mm. where I put it in this figure just to make one holistic view about what is resilience. Um, and what I, what's important to know, because uh, most of you have already scanned the words, the learning organization is embraced by everybody. Um, the five words I put uh, below are the, is the fifth discipline by uh, Peter Sanch. 
it states if you um, design these five attributes or um, uh, capabilities into your system or into your teams, you're able to learn. Um, if you are dealing with an engineering resilient system, there's a lot of top-down command control, a lot of micromanagement, uh, the design of an Apple iPhone, for example. Um, there's not a lot of room for everybody to learn. People at Foxconn um, need to do their job and they can learn on their specific job, but the learning organization for the whole iPhone is l limited at that context. Um, the farther you go to the right, the more important the learning capabilities of organization is. So if an organization is limiting one of these five um, um, elements of the learning organization, you know as an, uh, you're also limited in your resilience. And that's how you can use it as your client. Are we sharing uh, the same mental model? Do I have a refinement where we're looking at the same pictures? Um, are we talking about the same strategic goals of our organization? Uh, do we talk about why are we doing stuff? People from the agile world will recognize this, but this is for everything applicable. And if you see that is limited, you know that you as a learning organization are limited and you can improve there. And by improving in sharing mental models, you know that your resilience will increase. It's easy as that. So when we start having conversations with customers, potential customers about this, what do you think we should start talking to them about? What's, what's, our, what's our first words to them? The first thing we need to know is to talk about um, what they think uh, the word resilience means to them um, and if they have any value for that word. Mm -hmm. And if, the, if it plays a role in their um, current reality, then you can ask them uh, what defines for you resilience uh, and then slowly go into the behavior discussion. Because, Do you think it might also uh, work to ask them you know, how resilient they think they are against the model that you showed earlier, the three different types? No, that's too soon. You, you too first, soon. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to know which behavior is for them applicable and how they look at it. So with some people, I, uh, as I interviewed the CFO and the CIO um, um, and other C-level managers to validate this framework, and different people looked at a different way at their company, and not everybody embraced the part that um, um, they should be able to deliver a new product. So with mm -hmm. the SME, the small restaurant, I said that, that they would receive um, uh, orders by email that was new for them and they would offer different um, uh, different food and they would um, distribute the food in a different way. Not every company is that flexible. And if you know that, then you can introduce the, be the behaviors of the system uh, of the resilient types one, two and three um, and make them um, conscious about what that means for their company. Because so how can you measure you do, resilience? Yeah. You know, you, you've, you've thought of, we've mentioned it a lot, but is, is there something that we yeah. can pick up and sort of say that's one unit of resilience? No, it's it's behavior. So resilience is behavior of your organization, how it reacts on um, on stress, on change. So you can also measure it. There, there's a guy that states, um, if you look at the revenue of your organization and your cost of your organization and you put it in a graph and you look at the moments that an, a change event hit your company and you can see your revenue going down and after that going back to normal and the curve that it's using is an indication of how resilient your organization is. That's, that's on specific dimension of course because it's a more complex uh, discussion than that. It's a good uh, but start it's all about behavior. Though. It's a, a very yeah. good starting point. So I've got one last question to ask you before we go to the, mm -hmm. sort of the general questions. Have you managed to stay resilient in 2020? I think so. <laughs> how, how, I'm how, still have here. <laughs> how, how have you managed it? Do you talk to your pot? <laughs> no, I try to do is do it every, um, it sounds silly, but um, to improve my um, setup here where I'm now sitting. So slowly on, I bought an, <clears throat> an wireless keyboard. I bought this microphone. 
and every month I slowly add something. So behind me you see uh, three white panels. Uh, those are really cheap. We hang it there because it improves the acoustics. Okay. Um, we moved away from uh, a bookcasing here because it was my library. I moved it upstairs because for uh, webinars like this, this is a more clean image. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that are my personally, uh, my type of resilience, slowly improving, learning uh, from this webinar. Um, I have a nice camera, uh, mm -hmm. but it still can be improved. And uh, that is my way to go for baby steps, baby steps. And But for that, I need freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have... That's in my own context, so that's, uh, that's how I stay resilient and I'm focused on our digital way of interacting. Brilliant, thank you. And I found it very educational, so thank you so much for that. Now, we've got a few questions that have been queued up, but if anyone wants to actually raise their hand and come off mute, um, you're going to be very welcome to. But I'm going to start with a um, particular question on there. So after the COVID-19 crisis, do you think the world's becoming more resilient to the next zoological coronavirus type incident? Or are we, <laughs> and this is me adding to it, are we going to plan for what happened before and plan to deal with that again, rather than building the capability of responding? What do you think? Well, the nice thing about this topic is that it's about complex systems. Uh, and that means that every answer can be a correct one. And you can always add the words, it depends. <laughs> um, what I find interesting is that I see that, that um, every country is reacting in a different way. And that the countries itself are reacting on each other. And that in the countries, even the um, uh, areas are reacting in a different way. So even in Germany, we saw in Bavaria, in Bayern, different images than we saw at the uh, North Rhine-Westfalen, so the more upper north part of Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody knows what is good or what is not good. But we have a certain type of freedom to experiment with it uh, based on the responsibility the, the government has. But we also as companies see it. I, I see a lot of companies that are switching within a week to Teams Mm -hmm. um, or a different um, um, video conferencing tools and are adapting to that technology. So even the restaurants are adapting technology to make revenue. I find that really inspiring. Um, and only you know, time will tell if the, the resilient behavior by adapting and changing completely will become part of our DNA or we have like in December, the, the, the talks, oh, that's not possible, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's only a matter of time that will uh, show us how deeply changed this the, the or our organization and our gov uh, governments and culture. Cool. Thank you. So, um, Roosevelt, you've got your hand raised. So I'm taking you off mute, hopefully, so that you can actually um, ask your question. <laughs> No, no please, sorry about ahead. that. That that was a. Uh, I apologize for that. That was earlier when I couldn't hear the speaker. I forgot to lower my hand. I apologize. Oh come! No, no need to apologize. Come on, ask a question. <laughs> I'm I'm sure there must be something that um we can ask Ed so that he's hoping not to be asked. Well, well, this is uh, I'm kind of um new to this topic, but just I was just the the, the concept of D Y A. Uh, framework. I missed the beginning of the, uh, the the session. What exactly is the DYA framework? Uh, that's something else. That's the um, um, the view of society on enterprise architecture. And uh, we are currently writing a new book uh, on this, and we're incorporating the complexity science and system of systems way of thinking into enterprise architecture. Um, this topic is a small part of that vision, um, and we're, yeah, those two topics are now colliding. Does that answer your question? I think so. Was, oh, you're back. Well, yeah, specifically, uh, I was. Does it stand for something that's specific? I was. I looked it up. Uh, D. What does the D stand for? Y A. 
Oh, this uh, stands for dynamic uh, um, architecture. Okay. So uh, DIA started in 2001 uh, at Sochi, Netherlands, with four writers that uh, written a book, and after that, um, produced in 10 years uh, four to five different books on this topic. Their point of view was that enterprise architecture should be about the strategic dialogue in a company. So um, enterprise architecture from the old school way was defining, um, so basically the, the, the engineering resilience parts of architecture, thinking, thinking, uh, making nice uh, drawings about this is our hierarchy, this is our organization, this is our IT systems. And what DIA states is not about the definition of those nice drawings, it's about the conversation about it. What do you want to achieve? And if um, um, there's something risky you want to take, it's okay to um, not go uh, through the principles of the architecture, but to try something new. So here you also see that the DIA view of point on enterprise, on enterprise architecture is overlapping with the definition of resilience. It should be about communication, it should be about learning, it should be about creating value together and not about the limitations and uh, you should only use technology X. And if you do it, uh, if you don't do it, you're fired. Uh, that's, a, that's an old school way of looking at architecture. And that's the same for the functionality of a system or how business processes are designed. It's more important to have that conversation, conversation with each other. What's the added value? Who's responsible? Um, how can we deliver that value? Excellent. Great, thank, thank you. you. So, the end of time. A um, couple of things to sort of end with. First of all, Edzo, thank you very much. Um, very much appreciated all of the work that you put in there. Congratulations on you know, getting your masters in this as well. And your timing was impeccable. Yeah. I've got to watch what you do for your next thesis because I'm going to start buying shares and whatever that's addressing for the future. <laughs> now, there's also a bit of a sort of a general ask as well in that within the labs, we have a number of circles addressing different topics. And I think resilience is absolutely key to that. And what we're looking to do is start a circle off in that which Edzo has kindly volunteered, stroke being volunteered to sort of um, help kick off. So if anyone who's listening to the call or been on today wants to know more about it, please do reach out to Edzo, um, you know, join the Resilient Circle and you know, see what we can do with this to help our customers, help the organization, help our colleagues and help ourselves as well. Um, I'd like everyone to stay safe. We will get through the crisis. You know, I think we've seen some amazing things that people have done. The response of organizations, including CAP, in some areas have been absolutely amazing. Do reach out to us. Thais, thank you so much for being behind the scenes on this, Topeka for bringing it all together, and for Mikel for enabling us to be able to do this. There will be another session coming up in the near future on another topic. Um, please watch your inboxes for that. And the final word, Edzo, to you. Um, well, you can download my thesis using the QR code. So it's available online um, uh, at Zenodo. Um, and you can hit me up for a uh, um, link to the public domain part of this. And uh, yeah, keep on learning. That's the way out of this crisis. And uh, I think also a way to being happy. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Edzo, been a pleasure as always. And hopefully see you all on some of the next sessions and maybe see a few of you in our resilient circle. Have a very good, safe day. Have a nice day. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew, Edzo, and uh, thanks, Thaisis, for supporting us in this uh, webinar as well. And uh, I thank all the attendees who have been part of this and joined us. Thank you.